Well, good morning. We are just a few minutes away from getting started and uh, doing our sound test and just uh, trying to make sure that we have the video set up. Um, am I in the middle? Um, it's, it's coming up. It's okay. going to be focusing a lot. Okay. Okay, so and now, how's it look? Good. Well, good morning, and uh, it's Monday. Uh, okay, so I can't help myself. Um, I I uh, I definitely have some friends who will appreciate this. May the fourth be with you. It is the fourth of May, and uh, I uh, I am a Star Wars fan. I don't know if I'd go as far as a Star Wars geek, but. Uh, couldn't help myself. Um, let's open with prayer, and then we will dive into Bible study. Loving Father, we give praise and thanks for this day. And um, as we have the gift of being in your word and being in Revelation 7, and um, being given uh, two visions of your people, um, visions intended to encourage and comfort. Um, Lord, may we find encouragement and comfort from you today. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be uh, at work in our hearts and our minds, opening us up to hear uh, what you would say to us um, through your word today as we study this passage. Uh, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, one of the things that I'm encouraging us to do is to put on Revelation glasses, where we read the book of Revelation and we are given these visions, these visions um, intended to help us be able to see the world more clearly. Um, if we just see with our bare naked eyes, we will not see enough. Um, there is more going on than just the physical, there is the spiritual. And uh, Jesus has given uh, this vision to us through John um, so that we might be wise unto salvation, that we might um, better understand, um, so that we can live faithfully for him. And, um, and, I, and so where we are as far as Revelation 7 is um, we're, we're going to court controversy today a little bit within the church. And, um, and that is, and so I'm going to give you a little bit of a background um, about dispensational theology. Um, you may never have heard the word. Um, if you haven't, don't worry. Um, we'll be talking about that today. Um, but last, our last session, uh, one of the things that we spent some time talking about is when it comes to studying the New Testament, one of the issues that comes up because the Bible is geared this way is the Bible is um, pointing us towards the end of this fallen age. And um, there is a historical arc and uh, this age that we live in, um, this um, is fallen from the time of Adam until the coming of the second Adam at resurrection. 
sin and death mark um, this world. But the Bible, beginning in the Old Testament, and then uh, sharpened and clarified in the New Testament, holds out that um, things are not the way they're supposed to be, and um, this brokenness, this sin, this death, is going to be dealt with. And this, and this age marked by these things will come to an end. We call the study of the last things, the end, um, how things all wrap up before we enter into eternity. And then even then, you know, the little bit we can say about eternity, um, the big fancy name for this is eschatology. Now, I argued last time that the most important aspect of eschatology in reading the New Testament is the already not yet tension that since the coming of Christ and his death and his resurrection and then the sending of the Holy Spirit, we already are living in the last days. And yet we, in this time period between his first coming and his second coming, um, which has lasted 2,000 years, and all of this is the last days, uh, that there is this tension of already we're having a foretaste of the age to come. The Holy Spirit's been given us. We, we have the first fruits of what eternity is going to be like. We are not waiting for eternal life to begin when we die or when Jesus comes back, but already we're invited into eternal life. But it, it's not consummated, it's not fulfilled, it's not in completeness. Um, physically, we still die. And so that tension between the already, the not yet, between already we're experiencing the life to come, but not yet in its fullness, is the most important aspect of, of really reading the New Testament. Now, there's, there's more to eschatology than just the already not yet. Um, what do we do about heaven, and then the life to come, and resurrection, and final judgment, and, and then hell, Hades. Um, and, and so there is more information given, both by Jesus as well as the apostles. And... Um, and so we need to try to make sense of this, and how we make sense of all this stuff impacts our understanding of how we read the Bible. Now, there are different schools of thought there, and you know, and that's where I, I began with this analogy of glasses. Um, there are some major ways that people approach um, reading about, especially end times thing and how God's going to fulfill all of His promises. Um, one of them is called dispensationalism. Um, usually dispensationalism is contrasted a little bit with covenant theologians. Uh, dispensationalism is a term that's rendering a biblical idea about a certain administrative age or time period. Um, the most obvious would be the difference between being the, under the old covenant and being under the new covenant. And you would call one the dispensation of the law um, maybe a more accurate term would be the Torah, and then and then you would be under the dispensation of grace. Um, this sort of language it would be supported as far as just by the Bible of just recognizing Paul will talk about different dispensations, these different time periods. Dispensational theology um, is typically associated um, with, with some different people going back into the 1800s and moving forward. It's in particular associated with American theology. And um, if there's one seminary that is at the heart of understanding dispensational theology, it's Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, now, dispensationalism is a valid school of thought about how to make sense of these end times things. Um, it, it is. It has very strong opinions, and it, and it and it takes a particular approach. For me, the history of dispensationalism is significant. It, it it seems to be in some ways a reaction. In the 1800s, you began to have a very strong movement and push against the church, trying to push the church out of society and out of the university. And there was a lot of skepticism at the university level about miracles and the Bible. 
in the age of science, so much had been unlocked about the mysteries of the world. And so any story of a miracle just seemed to be superstition and nonsense. And so you had a strong push of trying to explain away all the miracles of the Bible, especially at the scholarly level. A number of books started to be written questioning all the things about Jesus' life, as well as all the things about the Old Testament. Um, these people who were coming at it this way, um, some of them were church members and some of them were outside the church. Um, and, um, at, and as this movement pushed forward, you had a reaction uh, from the church and, and people in the church holding up and saying, wait a second, this isn't biblical orthodoxy, this is leading to heresy, you're denying the resurrection, you're denying the divinity of Christ, you're denying the authority of scripture. And in the 1800s, you began to have this battle. Well, some names like Schofield and Darby are kind of the fathers of this dispensationalism. And, and part of it was dealing in this fight. You, you always had this push coming from um, those who were trying to reject biblical Christianity, of, of just taking everything as symbol, metaphor, uh, loosely interpret, you know, you, it, it doesn't mean to be literal. And, um, you know, and you hear that a lot, and you go, wait a second, wait, God, God says these things, um, so no, we should take them as being real and literal. And um, the challenge, though, is, is that when we're dealing with prophecy, and, and realize that part of the argument in all of this is that we have a whole bunch of Old Testament prophecies that pointed forward to Christ, which were all signs that he was the Messiah. And so battle lines would get drawn up at, at just some of these points about how do you interpret these Old Testament things and what do you do? So uh, the church is reasoning, and I'm going to use the word in, uh, intentionally, reasoning, arguing back, against the push to reject all of biblical revelation as nonsense. And, um, and as the push was, okay, so this, is, this isn't taken literally, it shouldn't be taken realistically, it's just a mere symbol, nobody was expecting resurrection, somebody made that up later on, and then the push comes back, no, no, you've got to take it literally. Overall, the idea of a literal interpretation is exactly what we should be doing with the Bible. But I think what got lost a little bit, and it seems to me, especially back in the 1800s, is the literal interpretation is the literary interpretation. And so when God makes a promise, but he makes it through a prophet, and it's through a prophetic oracle that is in some way poetic, we, we have to allow the type of literature that we're reading to guide how we're to interpret this. Um, and so I'll, I'll use a simple example. I used it last week. Um, when Peter is explaining Pentecost, he quotes Joel. And he talks about the sun and the moon and the stars and the moon turning to blood and the stars falling. And he's saying, brothers and sisters, this is being fulfilled in your hearing. And, and Joel was making a real promise. But he was using language in a way that was not to be taken literalistically, like it has to look exactly like this, that we have to go out and there's going to be a certain shade of the moon as a color, and then we know it's finally been fulfilled. He was using language the way that we all use language in some way metaphorically. It's an earth-shattering event. Uh, things are going to be turned upside down. And, and that sort of reading... I think is is supported by just what Peter says. Um, the, the literally the moon, the moon what didn't turn to blood, stars didn't fall from the sky, but it was an earth shattering event. And and he's saying, look, that which was promised is being fulfilled now. So the idea of taking a literal interpretation is good as long as we respect the idea that a literal interpretation is a literary interpretation. And so we're in apocalyptic literature, and it's highly symbolic. And, and one of the things that I hope you notice here is, is that we're, we're trying to work through these symbols and understand its meaning. Um, but sometimes we, we, we can't always have great precision. Um, 
and and we can't and, I, and so some of this is guesses we think it's this way we we know we don't have to guess when we get angelic interpretation that's going to happen once in a while we're in revelation but we're we we read we reread we read it in community um the, the major things i don't think we'll miss some of the minor things you know that's the part where we can say well it might be this it might be that so one of the things about dispensationalism is that it was a reactionary movement against a push against biblical orthodoxy, against biblical Christianity. It pushed back. And, and in some ways, I mean, this was a good thing to do. It needed to do these things. But in the pushback, it, the tension, the line of saying, well, you, here's one of the, you know, this is like the fundamental principle of dispensationalism. You have to assume that if, it, if there's something there, then it has to be literally fulfilled in some way. Now, newer dispensational scholars recognize that some of those old systems were a little bit overdrawn. You know, I mean, this is the part where all language in some way is symbolic, and so what do we mean when we say literalistically? Now, at the heart of what this is building to is, is that Dispensationalism has a very strong view about the identity of Israel and the identity of the church. And in dispensational theology, it read the Old Testament and all the promises given to Israel in the Old Testament. And it says, okay, all those promises given to Israel have to be fulfilled to Israel. And there's no possible way that those promises are, were intended or can be fulfilled by the church because those are two different dispensations and they're two different identities and therefore the, the destiny of the church while converging at some point in the future with the destiny of Israel must remain separate in these different dispensations and all the promises of the Old Testament are really have to be fulfilled in Israel. Now, this is where in some expressions of Christianity in America, you'll have this very strong sense of supporting the nation of Israel today, where he's saying, see, God has the nation of Israel specially chosen, and there's all these promises, and, and certain things are going to have to happen. The temple's going to need to be rebuilt. You'll get different versions of this as you're trying to piece together all of the different pieces of what the Bible says about how the end will work out. But they're working off the principle of a very literalistic interpretation. The promises given to Israel have to be made to Israel. They don't apply to the church. Now, I, I, I am not a dispensational scholar. I've, I've studied it. I've looked at it. I've read a number of their books. Um, I think they're Christians. I think that it's a valid approach. Um, I find it problematic. And... and and I find it problematic because, and I read this today, um, you know, that you will find things where they will say, you know, there's nothing in the New Testament that supports the idea that in any way a reference to Israel can be made to be a reference to the church. And I go, huh, wow. Um, when Paul says in Galatians that the church is the Israel of God, I, I think that's speaking to the church, not just Jews in the church, but the entire church of Galatia, which was mostly Gentiles. Um, when Peter is making his blessing in 1 Peter, you're a nation of priests, um, a holy nation set apart in his opening. Um, he's speaking to the church, which was mostly Gentiles. So I listen to, to what they have to say. I'm open. They could be right, I could be wrong. But in the end, I have to go with my own conviction and say, I, I, I just fundamentally don't find that argument convincing. And, and this is the part where this, this plays into what happens in Revelation 7. Because in, I think that if you come to the book of Revelation, you read through it, then you reread it, and you reread it again, you want to deal with the book as a whole, you want to try to have the book help you understand its parts, and then after you do that, you bring in the rest of the Bible, and it gives light. Like I said, I don't think there's a lot that we learn new in Revelation. I think it's a lot of what we already know. 
but it's reset in a very powerful and dramatic way that's, that's intended to give us hope in the midst of hard times. So, one of the, my, my experiences, though, and, and, I, and, and this is why I take so much time with this, is that you'll always find within different schools of thought, I, I, um, you'll find it with covenantal theologians, dispensational theologians, they've got their pair of glasses on, they're looking out at the world, and if you don't understand that you're reading this through a certain frame, and the presumptions of your frame, and how it might shape you, it, it may impact, and you may not have the best reading of the text. But there's a more dangerous thing. A lot of people, well not a lot, some people when it comes to eschatology, they, they try to use it as a litmus test. And, and I've talked about this before where they're going to go, okay, so... Are you a premillennialist, or are you a pre-trib premillennialist, or are you a mid-trib, or you're a post-trib? And you know, if you're if you're not a premillennialist, then you probably don't treat the Bible um, as really the Word of God, and we should probably be questioning your faithfulness um, to Jesus. I mean, are you really a Bible-believing Christian? And um, and that's where we start to get into this judgmentalism. And there are people when it comes to the dispensational, where if you if you even bring up the idea that the church really is now the Israel of God, that the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises are an amen in Christ for Christ's people today, and that, that the Israel of the Old Testament is not identified with the, is the nation of Israel today. Um, some people from dispensationalism will use this as a litmus test and they'll think, you don't really treat the Bible um, well. Maybe, maybe um, you're really quite loose in your understanding of Scripture and, um, and they may even question your Christian faith. Um, not all, but it's out there. And, and what I want to encourage people to do is, um, is go, okay, so unity in the essentials, diversity in the non-essentials, charity, love throughout. Um, you and I can disagree over our positions on dispensationalism or covenantal theology. Covenantal theology, again, is a different way of, of looking things from dispensations. You divide up scripture based on different covenants, and they may not be, they, th those time periods of covenant can be over overlapping where dispensationalism is very distinct. There's different, dis there, you know, there's different systems of thought Often seven is a good biblical number, so there, you know, there, there are some schools that have seven dispensations between the first dispensation under Adam until we get to the end. Covenantal theology says God made a covenant with Adam, God made a covenant with Noah, God made a covenant with Abraham, God made a covenant with Moses, and um, God made a new covenant through Jesus Christ, God made a covenant with David. And tends to look at those covenants as a way of kind of looking at the different ways in which God establishes relationship with us. You can be a dispensationalist, you can be a covenantal theologian, um, and, and those are really the non-essentials. The essentials are, do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died for your sins on the cross? Do you believe that he was raised from the dead? And, and it's really what our salvation is tied up into. And when we get into eschatology and the study of last things, it by and large is a minor. Um, it's, it's stuff that's been given to us. It's intended to help us have hope. It's intended to give us courage. It's intended to direct us and to keep us focused. We have a purpose here on earth. Um, it's not intended to be, and I'll, I'll make this argument again, Revelation is not intended to be a jigsaw puzzle that if I get all the pieces right together in the right place, I'll know exactly how all the details are going to be at the end so that, so that I can know exactly what's going on and be at the right place at the right time. Um, that's not faith. That, that, that's me looking for a certainty that is just not promised in this age. Nobody knows the day or the hour. There's not going to be this perfect picture where I figure everything out. Um, so what I'm encouraging us to do is to say, okay, I'm not going to get judgmental. I'm going to focus on unity. I'm going to focus on love. 
And what I want to do is I want to read Revelation and I want to get its message. And, um, and you know, and, and, and I'm trying to do that. I'm going to make an argument today. I'm going to argue that um, all of Revelation 7 is about all of God's people. Um, not some Jews and some Gentiles, but it's really speaking about God's people as a whole. Um, but to get there, I need to go back uh, to Zechariah. And um, I'm going to read for you Zechariah 6, because um, it, it, this is the part, I've read through it, I've read Revelation, I, I've, I've reread it, I'm now studying it in detail, I realize there's all these Old Testament allusions, um, there's no way I can do this all by myself. So I'm going to read some other Bible students, I'm going to get some commentaries, I'm going to look and see what other people have done over the years about trying to come to terms with what this message of Revelation is. And as I do this, and I realize, okay, one of the books of the Old Testament that is foundational in understanding uh, the Revelation is Zechariah. And so, you know, I, I'm going to read Zechariah, and I'm going to and I'm, I'm going to read it for familiarity, to get its message, so that when I read through Revelation and I'm studying, I can hear the echoes and go, huh. You know, I think in some way Zechariah is influencing this vision. It's background information so that we can see more sharply the intention of the message and the meaning given to us in Revelation. Okay, I've been any questions um, on dispensationalism or what I've been talking about? Hearing none, I'll move forward, but if you do, go ahead and write them down. In, Revel in Zechariah chapter 6, we, we read this. I looked up again, and there before me were four chariots coming out from between two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had a red horse, the second black, the third white, and the fourth dappled. Okay, so when did you last hear about four colored horses? Okay, the breaking of the seals. Um... This is the part where Zechariah 6 and, uh, is picturing these horses, the colored horses, the same colored horses that were called forth um, in the breaking of the seals. Um, that's no mistake. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these, my Lord? The angel answered me, these are the four spirits of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. Now, the NIV translation doesn't help you very much, or doesn't help you very well, as far as really catching the complete echo that, that John was creating. Um, the word for spirit in Hebrew is chruach, and it, it can mean spirit as in the living essence of a being, uh, or a spirit like an angel, or even the spirit of God, uh, the invisible that you can't see, um, and but doesn't need a body, but is still a living uh, being. But it also means wind and breath. And so, th when you would hear this, and, and, and the picture is, is that there's these four chariots. They come from north, south, east, and west. They have these different colors, and they're, and they're winds. And, and that's... the. the and, and this is the part where judgment is coming and it's pictured as four strong winds like warrior chariots coming. And, and you know, and if, if, imagine the greatest superstorm that you ever saw and all that wind blowing in all different directions and all the chaos and the power and the force. And in some way, that's what's getting pictured here. Um, and so there's these four spirits or these four winds of heaven. They are like chariots. Uh, one is driven by a black horse, one is driven by a red horse, one is driven by um, uh, a white and the fourth dappled. Notice John, when, when we see these four horses coming, that they the order is different than is given in Zechariah. These are the four spirits of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. Um, and then you get the north, the south, the east, and the west. But, but that's the background where you go, okay, so if I've read Zechariah and, I, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm familiar with it, 
I know that there's four winds of heaven described as four warrior chariots that come and they bring destruction on the earth, like winds blowing over a great tempest coming from all directions. Who can stand against something like that? And, um, and so we go back to um, Revelation now. A little bit of backdrop to Revelation 7, just to remember kind of the drama that is, is done. And, and remember that this is, this is a scene that opens in Revelation 4, and we see um, God sitting on the throne. We don't really see him, but we see a brilliant light that has translucent gems that you can't look at because it's too blinding, but it represents his presence. And and what we feel, what we hear is thunder and lightning and peals of thunder and, and God is coming and it has, a, has the sense of judgment with it. Um, and, and the cry for justice in the Old Testament was the cry of the day of the Lord for God to come and set the world right, to finally deal with the problem of sin. And, and you have this expectation in response to the presence of God the whole heavenly court, and once everybody gets it, all of creation are going to worship. And then, the, and then there's a shift, and John is weeping. And then one of the 24 elders who was worshiping the Creator says to him, and, and, and he says, Look, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, don't cry. He's worthy to open the scroll. This scroll, which is important, it's written on double sides, it has seven seals. Nobody in heaven on earth or under the earth is worthy to open it. This is important stuff, John's crying. It, it, and, it, and overall, what we're guessing is, in some way, this is God's plan, his will, to bring about his salvation, to bring final judgment, to set the world right, but nobody can enact it. And if you go back, and you, and, you, and you think through a little bit of the Old Testament story where God called Abraham and made a promise to Abraham that I'm going to bless you and through you I'm going to bless all the nations. Your offspring are going to outnumber the stars in the heaven. And he, he's working in Genesis through the promise of the seed of how the serpent's going to be crushed, how sin is going to be dealt with, how things are going to be put right. And you move forward and you're following this and, you, and, and Abraham becomes a tribe and that tribe ultimately becomes a nation, but it's a mysterious thing because the way they become a nation is they get taken off into slavery. Um, well, they get they, they become slaves in Egypt, and um, for 400 years, as they're sitting in misery and they're crying out, and, and then God raises up Moses and, and comes, and he sets his people free, and he's going to make them a kingdom of priests, and, and you have this sense, okay, here it is, it's all happening, the plan's moving forward, maybe not quite in the way that we expected. But, but Israel, who's, who's being taken out of captivity, they come in and while they're being made a covenant with God, they already create an idol and they sin. And we see that the problem of sin is still present and, and it will riddle Israel's entire history and where Israel was supposed to be a light on a hill um, that couldn't be hidden, that was to draw all the nations, they looked, ended up looking much more like the nations. They fell into idolatry. And so you're looking for that faithful son who can overcome the enemy and not be undone. And, and now you hear the cry in heaven. Nobody on earth or under the earth in heaven. Nobody was found who could open the scroll. This is the long story. Who's going to be the faithful servant who finally enacts what God does? One of the 24 elders comes and says, okay, don't worry. Look. Now, what you hear is, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, I want you to pay attention to this lion of the tribe of Judah. Because we're going to hear about the tribe of Judah in chapter 7, and surprisingly, the tribe of Judah comes first. And, and there is this echo. Now, you, you, he turns and he sees, and what he sees isn't a lion, but it's a lamb who was slain. We've already talked about this. This is the way 
that God overcomes. This is the way his power is demonstrated. It's, it's one of the most powerful theological images that we have in the entire New Testament about understanding who Jesus is and the way that he wins. And, when, and, and, and you see the line of the tribe, and then you see the response, and he gets worshipped. And part of the reason that he gets worshipped is because he is going to draw people from every tribe and every tongue and every language towards God. He becomes the savior of the whole world, which what this whole story beginning back in Genesis was all about. Now I want you to hold on to that because that's going to come up in Revelation 7 as well. So that when we think of Jesus, we think of the lion of the tribe of Judah, but when we turn and we see, we see the savior of the world who who isn't just coming to make Israel successful or victorious and trample the enemies, but is coming to make a nation of kingdom and priests of every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Now, we see the worship, and then this is what we're expecting, we're excited for. He has the scroll, and he starts opening the seals. Now, the very first thing we see, and now we know a little bit more information, is, is that we see these four horsemen, who are the four winds of heaven, um, these four spirits who are coming and they are bringing judgment upon the earth. And, um, and four is the number of the earth, and, and there's this four, three structure of the seals, and the first four happen and they flow. Um, you know, we're, we're always asking the question, when does this happen? Um, one of the arguments I want to make is, is, is the, the more important question is what did he see next, not what happens next. Um, all these visions aren't intended to be seen chronologically like this happens and then this happens and this happens. He saw this, he saw this, he saw this. I think I'm going to prove the point to you today in Revelation 7. What he sees next isn't always what happens next. Now, my, my thinking overall is, is that um, the four horsemen of, of the apocalypse really are characteristic of the entire age between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. Um, I think it's also possible that it's even more characteristic of what will ultimately be seen as the Great Tribulation, where this all builds up and, and we're nearing the end, and there's reasons to think that it will get worse before, um, before Jesus comes. But I'm, I'm not as worried about that. What I'm worried about is, is I'm worried about listening, paying attention. I know these things are necessary for Jesus' plan of salvation to come about. It's going to happen on the earth, um, and, it, and, and, and there's going to be this suffering. Wars, rumors of war, conquest, power. We talked about all of this last week. In response to this, it, we, we move from the, the, the judgment that's happening onto the earth, and then we move back up into heaven, and we see those who had been killed because they held to the testimony of Jesus, and they were seen as martyrs, at, and, and, they, and, and their souls were underneath the altar, where they, you know, so that they were, in, in a sense, a sacrifice, where through their sacrificial death, um, which was, you know, for God, to God, um, because of what's happening on the earth, they're crying out from underneath the altar. This cry is hugely significant. It, it, it's the only petitionary prayer that we have, supplicational prayer that we have in Revelation. How much longer, O oh Lord? Now, this is a part where Revelation is a book of hope. This is a cry that the church has been crying uh, for generations. How much longer? We see the brokenness of the world. We see the tragedy of the world. There's altogether a likelihood that sometime in your life, you're going to be sitting there and you're going to say, Lord, how much longer do I have to go through this? How much? Now, the answer was just a little while longer until the full number of your brothers and sisters are coming in. And this is the, those who are being martyred. Now, the idea that we talked about was, okay, may not be, seem very comforting, but God's working a plan. There's a fixed number. There's going to only be so many. 
Um, and, and, and when the full number come in, um, and, and, I, and I always like to put it this way, when everybody who can be saved is saved, and maybe this is referring to actual martyrdom and the number of people who have to die, but in some way, we all of us are suffering as we bear faithful witness to Jesus. Whatever that is, we talked again about it last week with Paul, the suffering of Christ, just a little while longer. And then we get the sixth seal. And the sixth seal, I would argue, has the sense of the, the parousia. This is, this is, Christ is now coming. How much longer? A little while longer? A little while goes by? Okay. Now this is looking like it's heading up to final judgment. That's the feel. Things are coming to an end. The earth is responding. They cry out. Here's another prayer. They're directing it. Um, hide us. Oh no, the lamb is coming in his wrath. This is terrible. Um, and, they, and they ask this question, who can possibly stand in the midst of this? And then what you would expect is final judgment and moving things forward. This is it. But instead, what happens is, and then there's a break. And there's a different vision. And then I saw this. And what he sees next isn't what's happening necessarily next. And I'm, I'm going to make the argument it, it's not. But this vision is given. And what's interesting here is it helps answer the two questions that God asked. In particular, the question, who can stand? But it gives insight into the question about um, how much longer. And so with that as the backdrop, let me read for you Revelation 7. After I saw this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or the sea or any tree. Okay, so those four winds, those four spirits, and now you're thinking, where did I hear that? And you go back to Zechariah, and it's these four horsemen. And you sit there and you go, wait a second, I thought the four horsemen were released. I mean, when I read chapter 6, they were released. And the point of this is to sit there and to say what you're seeing now happens before the four horsemen are released over the face of the earth to bring judgment. Now, the argument for this is, is that, so what's going to go on here is, is that God is going to be sealing his people. And so you, you have this face of this judgment that's coming and it's being unleashed and the four horsemen go out and then the judgment even gets worse and everything's coming to an end and the question is who can stand? And, and if there's any fear going on inside you, if you are afraid of final judgment, you don't have to be. In Jesus Christ, you are sealed. That judgment is not for you. It's going to be okay. This vision is trying to help us see this reality. We don't know when before this happened. It just happened before. I could make an argument before the foundations of the world. God knew you. Um, and he chose you. Um, but, but the point of this is that before any of the stuff that we see happening in chapter 6 happened, before that, already there were the angels and those four spirits, and, he, and the angels are holding them back because now isn't the time for this judgment to begin because now God's people need to be sealed. Now, in particular, this is the part where what we end up... We don't know yet exactly who or what. We don't even know that it's being sealed. We just go, okay... This seems to be before the four horsemen are unleashed. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. Okay, so um, oh, it, there's so much symbolism here. Imagine, you know, I, we, don't, we don't know exactly the vision because it doesn't tell us this part, but... You know, the east is where the sun rises. It's where the light begins. It's, it's where when you're in the midst of darkness and you're looking for light, you look to the east and then the sun begins to rise and it's the dawning of a new day and you have hope. 
And there is this angel, and he's coming from the east. And he has the seal of God. Now, the seal is going to give you comfort. Um, you know, the, probably the thing that ancients would have pictured, first of all, would have been a signet ring, uh, a sign of authority. Um, this is a mark. Again, in Zechariah, you will have, this is interesting, in Zechariah, you will be told about um, a, the, the coming of the four winds, and then they're coming, and then this coming of judgment. And then there is this promise that those who are sealed will not go through the judgment. And, and in, in Zechariah, the seal is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is tau. And, the, and, and, and this is the part where, you know, you, so I read, I reread, I read some more, I, I read the rest of the Bible, but I don't read by myself. I go, I read other Bible students, I read commentaries, and... Um, I think it was um, Collins Collingsworth who said who who made this is that um, you know the, the typical picture uh, this is a little off tau is something like this but the way it would have looked in this is it would have been a cross so from Zechariah they got sealed. And they got sealed with a cross. Um, isn't God amazing? Um, you know, that, uh, but, what, th mm, at least 500 years before the Messiah, there's talking about a seal, and the sign that's going to seal God's people is going to be a cross. Um, here, influenced by Zechariah, he's coming with a signet ring, and that, or he comes with a seal, probably a signet ring, and, and you know that this is going to be a, important. A, a seal is used to mark as authoritative, belonging to me. Um, this was also something that was common where servants would be marked with seals. And sometimes they would actually get a tattoo on their forehead. Um, so we don't know exactly what's going on, but we listen to this. We hear an angel. Uh, the, the judgment's being held back. The angel's coming from the east. He has the signet ring of God. I've read Zechariah. I know it's going to be about, in some way, those who are going to make it through judgment, who are going to be sealed, that that's not going to be their fate. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who'd been given power to do harm to the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Okay, and all of this is coming together. Okay, here's going to be the servants of God. They're going to be sealed. They're going to be safe from the coming of these four winds and of this judgment. This, this will not be the only time that we end up hearing of a mighty angel suddenly interrupting and then saying something important. This is, uh, this is a momentous event in God's salvation plans. One of the things to know is that God's working a plan, and he is, he is protecting his people from judgment. He's the good shepherd. He knows what he's doing. He's, he's not going to allow us to be ultimately harmed. Now, I notice I say ultimately. We may suffer, we may ultimately end up even dying physically, but we're going to be safe from final judgment and we're going to be brought into eternity. Now, this is important. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Now, this is the part where dispensationalists say, okay, see, here it says Israel, so now you have to think, Israel, Old Testament promises, this is separate from the church. And, and so in their reading, they, they hear the number of 144,000, they hear Israel, and they say this refers to Israel, and the next section that comes refers to a different group of people. In fact, it's often common that that's how most people read this. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make an argument that this isn't the way to read it. We're being trained how to read Revelation. I heard a voice, and then I turned and I looked, and then he saw the risen Lord Jesus. And the voice, and when what he heard, the voice wasn't, what he saw wasn't exactly what he was expecting if he heard the voice of Jesus because it was the risen Lord Jesus. I heard 
the person say that it was the lion of the tribe of Judah, but then when I looked and I saw it was a lamb who had slain, I heard the number of their name. Um, now, numbers, revelation, we're coming into this, symbolism, okay. 144,000, 12 times 12, 12 a number of completeness, a 12 a number referring to God's people, we've had 24, we have, we have 12 uh, tribes of Israel, we have 12 apostles, we'll move forward into Revelation and we'll see 12 gates, we'll see the size of the city, ultimately 144,000. So we hear these things and we go, okay, so it's, it's not just 12, but it's 12 times 12, which is, you know, 12 squared. But it's not just 12 times 12, it's because 12 times 12 is 144, but it's 144,000. And so 144,000 is 12 times 12 times 1,000 or 10 times 10 times 10. And 10 is a number of completeness. You know, there's, for example, 10 commandments. And three is a number of holiness. And so this is like a really cool number. <laughs> and um, uh, now, we're, we're just sitting there, and, and, and then you can sit there and you can say, and it's um, 12,000 from each tribe is what we end up seeing, which is 12 um, times 1,000, which is 10 times 10 times 10. Now, so all of this is in some ways saying there's symbolism going on here. Not quite sure exactly the symbolism, except that it looks like completeness, wholeness, God's people, that sort of thing. Um, I heard the number of those who were sealed. Here's the people who are going to be protected from judgment. 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Okay? God made a people for himself. Now, remember Revelation 5? I heard the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Ishkar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. Now, I read this and I sit there and uh, Sean Bassler and I had a little conversation about this last week because, you know, it's like, okay, so I'm reading a genealogy. What exactly do I know about Old Testament or New Testament genealogy for that matter? Um, if I don't know much about it, this is something where it's like, well, I probably need to become a little bit of a student of genealogy because genealogies matter both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I may not even know how much they mattered. And so I probably should raise some questions about this. What's going on? Is there any significance? What can I compare this to? If you were to go back and you were to study the Old Testament, hmm, I think there's something like 12 to 14 different lists of the 12 tribes. And this list doesn't match any of them. That's significant. The only time that you ever find Judah coming first, and that's only a couple of times, is when it's a geographical listing, when you start in the south and you move north, as referring to the 12 tribes. Um, but whenever you do that, you don't get Levi in the mix, because the Levi didn't have any land, because they were the tribe of the priests. And so you sit there and you go, okay, this isn't about that. And so you're sitting there and you're asking yourself, and this is a very strange list. And then there's also this question. Why exactly are they being numbered? And are there any instances where I can go back where they numbered things? And if you ask that question, what you would find is that, hmm, the one time that you get where you're supposed to do numbering like this, because typically censuses were frowned upon in the Old Testament, is when you were preparing for battle. And then God would say, okay, I want to count off. Because typically he wants to make sure that you don't have so many people with you that you'll think that you won the battle because of you. So we've got to get a nice, perfect number. Notice I say that, perfect. I mean, that's, you know, the, there's no mistakes going on here. You're going to get a nice, perfect number so that as you go into battle and you represent God. Now, do you notice what the numbering is? Ah, going into battle for God. Okay, before the judgment comes, before any of the winds are released, God's people are going to be sealed, they're going to be counted, 
And, and, and this is the part where I believe that this is a picture that's helping to give us courage. You and I, I'm going to make this argument now, I'll, I'll try to prove it to you later. You and I are part of God's holy army. We are as witnesses. We don't do battle the way the world does battle. Again, we're, this, isn't, this is the part where we're, we're, you know, we're not getting a lot of new things, but we're getting different imagery that reminds us of the stuff that we've already learned in the New Testament. We're going to be his witnesses. We're going to go into battle with him. We're going to be his representatives. Now, at this point, we're kind of thinking, but really, is it me? Because this is the 12 tribes. Now, the first tribe is Judah. And Judah only comes first when you're dealing with geography, and this is not about geography. If you, if you notice this, this you, what you'll find is, is that you have um, the sons of um, Leah coming first, then the two hand servants, and then the sons of uh, Rachel coming last. And, um, and so in some way, you have this list, but... But technically, you see, you don't have the sons of um, all of the actual tribes because you have Joseph. And if you go and you look at all the genealogies, um, when you have Joseph, you have Levi. And when you have Levi, you have Joseph because now we're actually doing the sons of Israel. But when you, when you have Ephraim, um, or Manasseh, you get Ephraim. But here, you, you get Joseph, and then you get Manasseh. Joseph replaced Ephraim, and then Dan is excluded. And now, in some of this, this is the part where we're, we're not given interpretation, so we're, we're somewhat left to conjecture. We can make studied comments. We go through, we analyze, we look at this. You know, the, the general theory is, is that Dan gets excluded because Dan was most associated with idolatry um, and, and setting up idols. And, and, and if we go back and we look at the warnings given to the seven churches and the problem of idolatry, then that's the part where it's possible for you to be excluded from the people of God because of your idolatry. Warning sign. No Dan idols won't be part of the sealing process. Okay, got it. That's conjecture, but it seems to be a good reading of the list. Um, now, there's one instance where you'll get a reference to Joseph, and, and, and then you'll get a reference to, um, in that case, it was Ephraim and not Manasseh. But that was actually in a list where it said the Joseph and the son of Joseph and, and in that instance, it had to do with um, lining things up um, for holy war, where this was a census and counting. And so then the, that's another support of saying, okay, just in the numbering part, you kind of think this is about holy war. And then I take the Joseph and Manasseh thing, and that seems to make sense. And so in some way, you read this and you say, okay, a, a perfect number of people who are, who are going to go out and to do battle, representing God, in the, they all get sealed beforehand. Now, remember what happens in 5, where not until the full number of people come in, right? It's going to be limited, but there's a perfect number, and now we're getting a picture of the perfect number, these 144,000. It's limited. Okay, God's working his plan. He's got the right number of people. They're going to go. They're going to be his witnesses. Um, they're going to be in the midst of, of this conflict when, when the four winds get released, but they're going to be safe through the conflict? Question. It, it's a comment from Bill Root. At this point, the perception is that only the Israelites have been recognized as servants of God, verse 3, and received the seal, almost as if John is seeing what has happened in the past, not what is in the future. Okay, so John or Bill is, is sitting here and saying, you know, we're, we're, we're listening to this and it feels like it. So it's in the past and the Israel of God. Now, this is a vision. And, and this is a part where I said, okay, we know that what we're getting here is a picture of God's people here described as Israel, which, and, and it's happening in the past that so they're getting sealed. 
but it's really being sealed so that they can make it through the four winds, the judgment. And, um, and this is the part where, and I'll, and I'll make the argument right now before we end our time for today. I heard the number of their name. And when I heard the number, it was 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. But let me read for you what comes next. Verse 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. First vision, he sees 144,000. It's what he heard. But when he turns and he looks, and he's expecting to see 144,000, he sees a multitude that can't be counted, which is the fulfillment of Abraham's promise. And what you should do is identify that the 144,000 is the multitude, just like when you hear the lion of the tribe of Judah and you turn and you see the Lamb of God who was slain, and the lion of the tribe of Judah, who was of the tribe of Judah, ends up being worshipped because he brings in people from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language. And then what ends up happening, and, and we will end here, but I'll just give you, is... And this vision helps answer the question, who can stand? Because these are the people who are standing before the throne of God. Now, it's also important to note that this picture of standing before the throne, this all seems to take place after the judgment. So, you get six, which is kind of characteristic of our age. And then you go to seven, and your first vision takes you back before any of the judgment happens. The second vision takes you forward after it's all finished up. Chronology here is, is important only in the sense of knowing God has a plan. He knows what he's doing. You're going to be okay. You can go ahead and do your cries of saying, how much longer? But I want to give you revelation glasses and to say God knows what he's been doing from the beginning. He has sealed you. You're going to make it through this tribulation, and you're going to be among those who stand. Just hold on a little while longer. With that, let me pray. Lord Jesus, you call us um, to faith. We don't live um, by sight, but uh, by trust. You give us reasons to trust, and you give us reason for hope. Your light will shine. The darkness is not overcome. It is going to be difficult, and there's going to be times when we will cry out and we will wonder, Lord, where are you and what are you doing? But if we stand back and we look, you have given us all the information that we need. This is exactly what you promised. In this world, we'll have trouble, and there will be wars and rumors of war but we are safe in your hands. It's hard to live it. And so, Lord, we ask for your help and the strength that comes from your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful day.